Hi, I'm Cheryl Fox. Welcome to On The Red Dot. This week, we continue with our series, Friends for a Better World, where we track young social entrepreneurs doing good around the region while making friends in the process. This week, we head off to Indonesia to meet a young woman who's made it her business to keep sharks in the sea and out of your suit. Four p.m. Kathy She is on a plane to Lombok, Indonesia. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. This is no ordinary trip. The 32-year-old is taking a group of tourists on an eco tour to Tanjung Lua, a village off the beaten path for tourists situated over an hour away from the main tourist town of Kuta. Viewer discretion in this segment is advised due to the graphic visuals. I heard about Tanjung Lua before I came to Tanjung Lua, but um, actually seeing it for yourself, like sharks being brought in and sharks being cut up and all the bloody inerts of sharks just laid out like that. It was just... I don't think horrifying even justifies the feeling, but um, it's like I intellectually told myself that when I, when I first come down, I cannot show emotions because it's about wanting to be make friends with the people here. But it was really hard when you are put face to face with all the shark carcasses. So I think I just, I was just shocked. I was in shock at first and then I just st stood away. I just went to a corner and I, I just broke down. Tanjung Lua is the largest shark fishery in Lombok Island. Indonesia is the largest shark catching country, contributing to 13% of the world's catch. This according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization review in 2011. Heartbroken, Kathy had decided that something must be done to divert shark fishermen away from the trade. When I first came to Lombok, um, I wasn't sure how to start. I, I just knew that I wanted to provide alternative livelihood for them. So I thought of a lot of um, stupid things like maybe even lobster farming or um, um, bird's nest house. Yeah, so it was only after I talked to the fishermen more that I realised that um, they were not open to learning new things. They really just wanted to be in the ocean. So Kathy made friends with the fishermen and persuaded them to show off their beautiful hometown as boat guides instead. The history teacher of seven years resigned from a job and started a social enterprise, the Dorsal Effect, two years ago. Today, she is bringing a group of tourists on a full day treat, visiting Tanjung Lua's beautiful snorkeling sites and savoring its lush landscapes. It's a boon for the boat guides who used to hunt for sharks. Typically, the shark fishermen will go out to sea for about 14 to 20 days, sometimes a bit longer, to try to hunt. But before they even start catching sharks, they um, go into debt because they have to prepare their supplies for the boat and um, food and fuel and stuff. Yeah, so if they are lucky, they manage to catch anything. They come back with a good catch. They can make maybe about 80 to 100 USD for that one trip of a good catch. But when there's no catch, the fishermen end up in debt. Shark fishing is dangerous for the fishermen because they tend to sometimes go to areas that are protected, like um, they breach certain areas that are marine protected areas and if they get caught, they are actually locked up and they're, they're not allowed to take their boats back. So it's a very scary trade for them when they get caught. That happens because fishermen are increasingly driven further out to sea as the shark population dwindles. Making the situation worse are the month-long trips out to the ocean which poses unpredictable risks. There was once a fisherman shared also about um, how his boat was out in the, in the middle of the ocean and then his engine died. So they, they were stranded at sea for many days before somebody came to rescue them. Uh, so that was a very traumatizing experience for him. That's why some fishermen welcome Kathy's idea of becoming a boat tour guide, which leaves them with more time to spend with their families at home. 
Lui ana no, he klu yola munta papa sa sa mau. Amun de ja nyare an le pale ri padan te lalu mancing klu yun yo ket di tau tindo di prau te kosa kosa cumba goyang. Kathy charges $150 Singapore dollars per head for a full-day boat tour, with a minimum of four persons per tour. Of the amount collected, $150 goes to the fishermen, another $150 goes to transport expenses. Leaving the rest to cover her personal accommodation, food and flight expenses, which typically costs $400 Singapore dollars. The business idea won her 10,000 Singapore dollars in seed fund from the Young Social Entrepreneurs of YZ program hosted by the Singapore International Foundation last year. A program that helped her meet like-minded people to share her journey with. For the fishermen, hosting boat tours is a lucrative alternative to shark fishing. $150 all in a day's work, compared to the same amount that they would get after a month-long fishing trip there is one caveat though, there are not enough tourists. Kathy gets five boat tours on a good month, none on others. That's why she's only converted two fishermen so far. According to a local NGO, some 26 shark fishing boats still operate from Tanjung Lua. There's so many challenges, but I think the recurring one that keeps hitting me is um how do I go on if not enough people come and finances become a problem and an issue? That's not the only issue that Kathy's facing. Greater problems lie ahead. But for Kathy, there's no turning back from the work that she's found the calling for. Six AM, the busiest time at the Tanjung Lua Jetty. Fishing boats are just returning with their catch. In an hour or so, the auction for sharks would begin on most days, but not today. This is the ship where they usually bring the sharks in for the auction. The fishermen would drop the sharks over there at the harbour, and then they'll start carrying it on bamboo poles up all the way in. Then they'll lay it out according to the species of the sharks. Kathy normally sees five to seven regular middlemen bidding for the sharks. According to the Wildlife Conservation Society in Indonesia, 800 to 1,000 sharks land here in a month during peak season. Less than 400 during low season. So after the bidding is over, they'll start cutting up the sharks. And then they'll start reselling the parts also to different buyers before they transport it to be processed. This is the first time I've seen it empty. I've never seen it empty before. Normally, the first thing you would notice when you enter this place is the stench of death. This is the only time of the year when the auction square is almost empty. That's because the Muslim fasting month is just over. The fishermen took a break during the festival and have yet to return from their month-long fishing trips. One manta ray and a few small sharks, the sum total of today's catch. The bidders are not thrilled. No sharks means no business and no profits. Only sharks more than a meter in length are valuable enough to be auctioned. So the catch was unceremoniously hauled off to a nearby processing plant. The meat is made into satay. Low quality skin is fried and sold as crackers. But these make for small revenue. The real money rakers are manta gills and shark's fin of course, which are exported to countries like Singapore. Kalau untuk kulit pari ataupun hiu yang besar itu biasanya digunakan untuk uh, bahan kerajinan, bahan-bahan untuk pembuatan dompet, pembuatan sepatu, dan juga ikat pinggang. Untuk jenis kulit pari ini yang lebih mahal harganya karena dia memiliki corak yang lebih bagus di sini. 
For Kathy, it's a relief today not to endure the sight of lifeless sharks and rays holden by the dozens. For her, having no beautiful sharks or rays left to dive with in 10 years is too much to bear. The first time I saw a real shark. So it was really magical an experience to actually see something so magnificent in the water with somebody so dear to me. And it hit me like in the sense that what if I live in a world where children don't get to see sharks in the oceans anymore. It'd be really sad if the only way they can see sharks is in aquariums. So that hit me out like, no, cannot, must do something about it. What kind of sharks do you know? Like, do you know that? Uh, what is sharks? So she did. Kathy volunteers with Shark Savers, an NGO dedicated to saving sharks and mantas. Twice a month, she visits schools to give talks on shark conservation. But raising awareness isn't enough. She wanted to do something to curb the supply of sharks. That's why Dorsal Effect was born. I think my parents were initially shocked and I really don't blame them because I guess our parents worry about you first. Um, but over time, maybe they see that I really want to do this even though it's not, it's not raking in profits yet. But. Yeah, I don't know. I guess parents parents know you best as well, so they know that I'm not going to give this out anytime soon. So we just don't talk about it anymore. For Kathy, it's tough making a decision that didn't sit well with her parents. Still tougher to forgo a regular paycheck and watch her bank account slowly emptying out. Without the necessary volume, she makes a loss on each tour forking out some 400 Singapore dollars whenever she flies to Lombok to personally host her clients. It's not easy to have months where it's just zero bank account. I've never had that before in life. I was like before this I was a teacher. It's just every month you expect to get paid. But yeah, it just it was just a really huge paradigm shift for me because there are times where I don't know what am I, I really don't know what am I gonna do and I'll just break down and cry. And and that's the moments where you really appreciate the friends and the people around you who are just, you know, do little things like buy, buy you lunch, take you, yeah, just buy you, even buy you meals. I just appreciate that a lot. I really don't know. I can't even contemplate a life that I'm not doing this anymore. It's reached this stage where you just walk and you just keep walking on, even though you sometimes you just feel really, really terrible about it, but you just keep walking on anyway. Sustainability seems to be out of her grasp at the moment, but it's not her biggest bugbear. For this nature lover, what worries her most is the impact that she's leaving on the environment. I guess my biggest fear is, what if there are other implications to the environment? Like what if because of tourism, something else dies? Maybe coral bleaching happens because of the excessive use of sunblock by the tourists, things like that. I don't want it to backfire in terms of the environment being harmed in other ways as well. For now though, she's encouraged by the Gotong Royong spirit that the local community is showing. When we go on the trips, I get the tourists to pick up trash that they see. It's really heartening when you start seeing the fishermen also starting to pick up the trash. Like they get interested, they get curious and they see why we're doing it and they start doing it as well. I think that's the best kind of education. It's not about telling them what to do, but it's them seeing you doing it and they do it too. Okay, we're trying to sea stars back into the water so they don't dry up. But the sea stars are very resilient. Even if they lose a leg, they'll grow it back. Like the starfish that she saved, Kathy is resilient. She's made friends with the local conservationists and she's collaborating with them to propose an ecotourism model to the local government. As for me, I made a pledge many years ago to stay away from that shark's fin soup and it hasn't been difficult to stick to that pledge. I'm hoping that after having seen what you've seen, if you haven't already, I'll get you thinking about making a pledge of your own. After the break, we meet an ex-drug addict who turned his life around after living on the streets for over a decade.
stretching out on a concrete bed. Drinking alcohol to while away time. This was Taufik's life 18 years ago. And he wasn't alone. According to Indonesia's Ministry of Home Affairs, 94,000 vulnerable youths call the streets home. The reason? Poverty. Saya anak kedua dari lapan bersaudara, jadi sembilan, sembilan anak. Jadi, gitu. Pekerjaan bapak saya pedagang, mungkinan penghasilan uh, bapak saya cukuplah untuk makan aja mungkin. Karena untuk biaya sekolah pun jauh, sangat jauh. Thus began his nomadic life. Taufik left school at 14 to look for a job after the 1997 financial crisis. But that didn't end well. Instead of contributing to the family income, he fell into wayward company and got hooked on drugs. Kadang dalam satu malam tuh, empat dimensi bisa sekaligus dipakai. Dan pernah parahnya lagi itu nyaris apa ya? Jadi jantung tuh cepat terus kayak mau pecah dan saya udah nggak bisa apa-apa itu. Udah nggak bisa ngapa-ngapain. Alhamdulillah masih di apa? diberi di umur mungkin di umur panjang ya. Without much of an education, Taufik would earn 20,000 rupiah a day selling drinks by the roadside. That's two Singapore dollars, hardly enough to sustain his habits. He would spend at least 100,000 rupiah or 10 Singapore dollars on drugs every single day, five times what he earned. Being a drug runner became not only attractive, but essential to keep him going. Distributing drugs earned him 150,000 rupiah a day, almost eight times his earnings from the sale of drinks. Saya mencoba untuk berhenti uh, karena uh, hidup saya tuh udah apa ya? Kok begini-begini aja? Nggak ada nggak ada perubahan. Sudah mulai mulai mentok lah. Sudah mulai mentok nggak ada kayak nggak ada. Untuk apa sih hidup? Untuk apa sih hidup ini? Gitu. Taufik spent the peak of his youth in a hazy blur. 16 lonely years on the streets before he finally had a change of heart. Thanks to his brother who cajoled him and offered a way out at the learning farm. It was his chance to go back to school. So at the age of 30, Taufik enrolled in a social enterprise which takes in street youths like him on its four-month-long program, teaching them organic farming, entrepreneurship and life skills. Many of them have not completed high school or even um, not completed middle school. The kinds of job opportunities that are available are so limited. The population in Jakarta is now 13 million. The unemployment rate is astronomical, especially for young boys who have no qualifications. At 20% in 2012 to be exact, according to the World Bank, the highest unemployment rate in the Asia-Pacific region. At first, we were looking at um, farming as just as a form of healing for these boys. They had put a seed in the ground, they had seen it grow, they had cut it had packaged it, they had delivered it to the customer, they had got money. The whole cycle was complete and they had never seen that kind of success in anything that they had done before. We changed the curriculum to be a lot more focused on agriculture because we realized that this was actually a skill for life, not just a skill for healing. Kegiatan saya selama di Delering Farm, tiap pagi memberi pakan domba ini dan seminggu sekali Saya membersihkan kotorannya dan urinnya. Jadi kotorannya itu uh, untuk uh, dibuat kompos. The strength of our curriculum right now is how we look at hands, head and heart. The hands is the agricultural part of it. The heart is very much the healing that has to happen before the head 
can engage and before the hands can engage. And we work a lot with therapy and, and working through all the problems that these kids come in with. Taufik graduated from the learning farm in 2012. He now works at an organic farm and a shelter for stray cats. A job that he got thanks to a recommendation from a fellow alumnus, Rezki. Dia tuh udah seperti uh, saudara saya sendiri, sudah seperti uh, adik atau bukan kakak. Taufik applies his organic farming skills here. He's picked up new skills on the job as well, nursing the stray cats that the farm adopts. Ini kucing namanya Grace. Itu terkabrak oleh motor. Jadi makanya kakinya karena kakinya rusak ya. Jadi dia diamputasi. Masih banyak juga goda-goda godaan-godaan dari teman-teman yang masih mengajak saya untuk memakai lagi gitu, untuk nongkrong-nongkrong lagi. Ya, tapi juga saya kan eh, menolaknya juga secara secara halus, secara baik-baik ke mereka, memberi pengertian juga ke mereka gitu. Terus eh, tentang masalah ekonomi juga mempengaruhi juga sih ya. Indeed, he's changed the economic situation of his family. He now has a roof over his head and earns 170 Singapore dollars a month, enough to cover his personal expenses and give to his mother and siblings. He also saves at least 10 Singapore dollars a month. Closing a chapter from his past when he spent every single cent he made. Kalau saya tidak apa ke Delaring Pam, tidak masuk ke Delaring Pam, tidak mengikuti programnya. Mungkin saat ini saya nggak di sini, mungkin saya mungkin di di dalam kubur mungkin ya. Bisa mungkin saya uh, overdosis atau saya depresi. Thanks to donations from companies and individuals, the learning farm still operates today, with the sale of its produce only covering 40% of its cost. I hope you've been inspired by our social entrepreneurs and their stories. If you'd like to relive this week's episode or catch any of our previous shows, just head over to these websites and you'll be able to watch it online. And for a whole lot more on our show, just head over to our Facebook page in the meantime. Till we meet again next week, I'm Cheryl Fox. Take care. <laughs>